Anyway, Galatians chapter 5. We'll begin in verse 7. Paul says, You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from Him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view than mine. And the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Father, I just thinking about that passage, it's come up providentially this week a number of times. Jehoshaphat's expression there. Lord, I think of my brother James right now there in Austin. Pray you'd help him. Help him to preach. Help him to minister to those precious saints. Lord, in so many ways, we don't know what to do. And our eyes are on You. And Lord, there are such forces against Your work and Your people. And I pray You'd bear Your mighty arm. Do what exalts Your Son who's so worthy of what we just sang, of all praises, honor, and glory. Pray You bless our time in Your Word now. Lord, make it rich. Make it helpful. Make it edifying. Pray You'd speak to souls that are outside of Christ, Lord. Lord, please have mercy on lost sinners in our midst. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I feel like we just really just got started in verse 6. Um, and touching on the subject of love. But instead of, instead of remaining there, I thought it best just to move on and kind of knock out this paragraph before us today. And then we'll continue the discussion of love in our next message when we get to verses 13 and 14. In fact, this, this paragraph kind of seems like a, an interruption of Paul's flow of thought from verses 6, 13, and 14. I think if you took this paragraph out, it would flow perfectly. Um, and we found, and if you've, if, if you've read Paul, you, you find that that's not altogether uncommon with the way he writes. Um, seen this numerous times in this letter, haven't we? Paul abruptly making these emotional appeals, especially that's so in this, this, this letter. I'm astonished at you. Astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you, he says at the beginning. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? I, I'm afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Brethren, I entreat you. Have I become your enemy in telling you the truth? My little children, I am perplexed over you. These are the kind of statements that Paul makes in this letter. And once again, here in verse 7, Paul expresses his dismay, his astonishment, his disbelief over how these Gentiles, or these Galatian Gentiles, have been so easily moved away from the pure gospel that he proclaimed to them and delivered to them. And they've so quickly imbibed this false teaching of these Judaizers. You were running well. Paul observed that. Paul saw that with his own eyes. He witnessed how well these brothers and sisters were running. And it's like Paul, Paul gets into this teaching mode in this letter, only to be interrupted by his own emotions and disbelief oh, how this thing's completely gone awry since he left these brethren. He, he begins this chapter speaking of our freedom in Christ, followed by the slavery of law keeping circumcision there, followed by a very severe warning of falling away from grace and being severed from Christ to the thing that counts most. Faith working through love. And right when you expect him to develop this more, boom, here we go. Here we go again. You were running well. What what happened, brethren? What what changed? I'm, I'm so perplexed by this. And, and Paul's so perplexed in this letter, he even he even pens his own inward doubts and questions about his ministry in chapter four, verse eleven. I mean, did I did I did I labor over these people in vain? I, I mean, was this all just a waste? 
I mean, what, what is it to be all excited and expressive of God's glorious gospel and be full of joy one day, only to turn around and embrace falsehood the next day? Who, who or what has hindered your progress in your living this gospel out? Oh, brethren, this, I mean, this, this letter is such a soul-checking, take-heed letter. Now, in this paragraph, this particular paragraph, Paul, Paul hits us with a number of different metaphors. He talks about running. He talks about baking. He talks about sentencing, judicial sentencing. And, and then he works in a little sarcasm here at the end using circumcision wordplay that honestly gets rather blushingly graphic. So much so when I was, when I was first reading this section, I thought, how on earth am I going to preach that? How am I going to do it and keep it rated G? And I'll seek to do that. But, but starting here in verse 7, you were running well. I mean, Scripture in multiple places, we even heard it today. Jeff even refer, referred to it. It, it. it uses this illustration, this metaphor of running to communicate spiritual truth. I mean, that was our VBS theme last year, right? The, running the, the, the race of faith. This is actually the second time Paul makes reference to this theme of running this letter. Remember back in chapter 2, verse 2, we, we went over that. He says he went to visit the, the apostles there in Jerusalem in order to make sure he was not running nor had run in vain. That was a, that was a reason behind his visit there in Jerusalem. Paul tells the Corinthians, that, uh, who would have been very familiar with athletic, the athletic running in the games, those kind of events in the games, he says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Obtain what? The fullness of your salvation. That's the prize. Christ, everlasting life, eternal reward. You don't get those just by simply being in the race. By entering it. You get those by winning the race. You have to be in this thing of Christianity. You have to be in it to win it. Not just to be part of it. A lot of people like to be part of Christianity. A lot of people like to join a church. A lot of people like to go to church on Sunday. They're, they're part of it, to feel a part of it. You can't be in it just to feel a part of it. You've got to be in this thing to win it. To win it. And by winning it, Scripture is communicating to us actually finishing the race. You, as a Christian, it's required that you finish the race. Those who finish are those who win. And Paul speaks this way when he bids the Ephesian elders goodbye there in Acts chapter 20, saying, I do not account my life as of any value, he says. Quite, quite a statement. Nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course. That was his desire to finish the course, to finish what God had set before him, his will. His purpose in His life. He's speaking of a race there. And you know what? There's one thing that's true about everybody who enters a race. They all begin the race. But you know what? Not all finish. Not all finish. And there are many reasons for people not finishing a race. Especially when we're talking long distance running. Which is most reflective of the kind of running uh, that this metaphor uh, running the race of faith uh, refers to. You know, Christian life is not a sprint. It's not a hundred yard dash or or hundred meter. I guess we're in meters these days, or four hundred or eight hundred meter. The Christian life is a marathon. And, and you know, a lot can go. I don't know if you ever follow running at all. A lot can go wrong in a marathon. Pull a hamstring, especially when you get to my age. You pull a hamstring. You run out of gas. Your legs give out. You give way to mental weakness. Heat exhaustion, especially if you're going to run in San Antonio today. Heat exhaustion. Dehydrate. You stumble. You can, you can fall. You can twist an ankle. You can, I mean, other runners can take you out of the race. 
I mean, those are just some reasons why people don't finish a race. Endurance or perseverance seems to be the primary reason Scripture taps into this running a race metaphor. Finishing. Actually making it to the end. Folks who approach the Christian life like it's a sprint. Oh, I've seen this many times. We've seen this here. Jump in. They're all excited. It's it's like the seed planted in in the rocky soil, right? People don't make it to the end. They treat the Christian life like it's a sprint. They spring up with all kinds of excitement and noise and apparent joy, but they get scorched under the heat of spiritual reality. The trials sent to test their genuineness actually end up proving their lack of genuineness. Brother, sister, I mean, back to John's message. Praise God for the Moabites. That's what we, as God's people, we should be praising God for the Moabites. Why? Because they test the genuineness of our faith. That's why. They're a great evidence. Brother, sister, when you go through great trials in your life and God's thrown great trials at you and you come out the other side clinging to Christ, still trusting God, that's a great evidence that God has made you a righteous marathon runner. Grace does that. God does that. Flesh doesn't hold up. I mean, the trials are some of the greatest, greatest evidences of God in your life if you're clinging to Him. If they do like, like, like the trial that Jehoshaphat was facing, if it, if it produces that in your life, putting you on your face and putting your trust in God, you can be assured that's God at work in you. When Paul, when Paul gets to the end of his life, he thankfully expresses in the closing statements of his, of his last letter there to Timothy, I finished the race. I have finished the race. Paul was already tasting glory. He knew he, was got, he had gotten to the end. He'd done everything that God had called him to do. I've finished the race. God gave him a sense it was over. That is, I have faithfully endured to the end. Henceforth, he says, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me come that day. And yet, you know what, brethren? Sadly, right after those words, he says, Timothy, please, please do your best to come to me. For Demas who's in love with this present world, has deserted me. He didn't finish, Timothy. He bailed out. He stumbled over his love for this world. I mean, I can imagine Timothy's first reading this letter. Demas? No way! Not Demas! Yes, Demas. Demas was hindered from finishing. Notice Paul's question here. Who? Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Now, Paul knows the answer, but he's wanting them to face this reality and understand that they're, they're presently being hindered in their running of this race. I mean, they started out like gangbusters. Paul saw it. Receiving the glorious message of Jesus Christ by faith. Running well. Hydrated by the Holy Spirit. Running with beautiful Gospel-bearing feet. And then suddenly, things changed. It's important to point out by way of reminder, you know, the Galatians didn't consider these Judaizers to be a hindrance. That's what Paul's calling them. That's not what they considered them to be. They regarded them as a tremendous help. They thought they were, they were aiding their Christian lives. They were enhancing their walk with God, uh, making them more holy people or so they thought. Yet the Apostle calls them out as a hindrance. They were actually impeding the Galatians' progress in this race by their false teaching even endangering some to fall away from grace and to be severed from Christ, to make shipwreck their faith. 
in asking the question, who's hindered you? Who's hindered you from obeying the truth? Paul is essentially defining what it means to run the race. It means to obey the truth. To live your life in obedience to the Gospel. To run in obedience as we follow Jesus Christ's will for our lives. The word hindrance in the original is the word incapto literally means to cut into. To cut into or impede one's course by cutting, uh, cutting off his way. I'm, I'm headed this way. Boom. Cut off. And you know what's interesting? <laughs> In fact, the NIV actually translates this. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? Now, I find it very interesting that a non-literal translation would actually literally translate this verse. <laughs> uh, go figure. Even so, cl clearly this is a play on words by Paul. By using the language of cutting here, he, he's clearly alluding to both the illustration of circumcision as well as cutting in front of someone while they're running so as to impede their progress. Those of you that are old enough here uh, to remember the 1984 Olympics, <laughs> how, many would you, how many would that be? Um, I grew up watching the Olympics. So you may recall the incident of those Summer Olympics um, where this, the U.S. female favorite in the 3,000 meters, Mary Decker, she was favored. She couldn't participate in the previous Olympics because I think it was in Moscow and they were boycotted. So it was a much anticipated event. She was favored. She had one challenger. Her name was Zola Bud, little barefooted lady. And uh, partway through the race, Zola starts to pass her. She cuts off in front of her too, too soon, gets into her lane too early. And she trips her up. She falls, gets injured, and Mary Decker never finishes the race. And there was a huge debate about it being intentional, and, which it looked like it was, but hard telling if that's just looking at it with American eyes or not. But either way, she was cut into. It's a perfect illustration of what happened, what, what Paul's talking about. Cut into, cut in front of, impeded her progress, knocked her out of the race hindered her from finishing the race. In like manner, Paul is concerned here that these Judaizers are doing their best Zola Bud imitation and hindering the Galatians from finishing their race. With pun intended, Paul is pointing out to these brethren, while you have become so enamored and bewitched by these obsessed circumcisers, you fail to see or detect that they're actually cutting into you and hindering your progress in the Gospel. Verse 8, this persuasion is not from Him who calls you. I mean, these folks, yeah, they've, they've created a big splash and made some impression on you, but... but None of what they're teaching you and none of what you've been persuaded by them is from God. What's alarming here is how easily they've been duped. Christians. They actually needed the Apostle Paul to come alongside them and point this out. They didn't see, they didn't perceive that the very thing they were embracing was threatening their Christian lives. What, what they thought was from God was just the opposite. They had mistaken their enemy for an ally. And this, brethren, just underscores the need for us to have and develop and grow in spiritual discernment. Now we talked about this in previous message, it's not as though these Judaizers were not using Scripture to substantiate their claims and their dogma. No, sir. They would have been appealing to Genesis chapter 17 and Genesis 21. They had their biblical arguments undergirding their false teaching. 
The Galatians just lacked the discernment to, in understanding that circumcision's application was terminated in the full fulfillment of Jesus Christ. It was pointing to a greater spiritual reality of the circumcision of the heart. So they were succumbing to the influence of the Judaizers. And brethren, we are living in a day where there's a whole lot of influence attacking God's Word. Yes, on one hand, we can say that's always been happening since the garden. But that's certainly, yes, that's certainly been the case by the unbelieving world. But now we, we have Christians, Christians, God's people compromising God's Word left and right. It, it seems like nearly everything in the Bible, you name the subject, it's up for grabs in our day. If it's not scholars doubting the veracity of God's Word, it's, it's Christian leaders telling, telling us the Bible doesn't mean what it really what it really says it means, or they're explaining it away uh, what it really means due to, due to ever-changing cultural norms in our world. I mean, just last year, the most dominant conservative denomination in the United States, Southern Baptist Convention, ordained their first three women as pastors. That's unbelievable. I mean, are you kidding me? How, how does that happen? Lack of discernment? Lack of real conviction of what God's Word says? Compromise? It happens by bewilderment and a conscience being held hostage to social pressures and not God's Word. It happens by the influence of man. Oh, brethren, pray for spiritual discernment. As a Christian, you should be praying for that. And God keeping you grounded in His Word. Because these, these are times of foundation shaking. We're living them right now. We're in those difficult times that Paul wrote Timothy about where people are lovers of self and lovers of money and proud and arrogant and abusive and disobedient to parents and ungrateful and unholy and unheartless and slanderous, without self-control, not loving good. Doesn't that sound like American culture today? Very much so. Treacherous, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And here it is, having an appearance of godliness but denying its power. Such folks do not finish the race. Verse 9, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. As Jesus did, Paul utilizes leaven as a metaphor depicting false teaching. Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. That is, beware of their false teaching and their hypocrisy. Paul picks this up and does the same thing in reference to the Judaizers. He also makes this analogy in his letter to the Corinthians when addressing the disciplinary case there in chapter 5. He says, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? A little bit of sin affects the whole church. Doesn't say... We're all sinners. Just let them stay in the church, Paul. Come on, be loving. Paul, be loving. Just let the, sin, let the sin remain in the church. It's not what Scripture teaches. Yeah, that is the prevailing winds of our day. In other words, Paul's saying, cleanse out. Clean out. Cut off. Cut off and out the leaven that it doesn't infect the whole lump of dough. Yeah, so Paul switches metaphors here from running to baking. But, but his concern and warning are the same. The danger of being cut in or infected by the spread of leaven is a danger of one's, one's spiritual well-being. There's a real threat of corruption within and being taken out of the race by false teaching. And the enemy has taken countless souls down by this. By false teaching. 
But notice the sudden shift Paul makes in verse 10. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view than mine. So, so despite the danger of these Judaizers leavening presents, despite their efforts to cut in and hinder them from finishing by essentially taking them off the, off the path and, and directing them on another course, another race, as it were, despite all that, Paul says, I am confident. I love that. But, but notice where Paul's confidence rested. It wasn't in these bewitched Galatians. His confidence was in God. I am confident in the Lord. Paul believed that God was going to use this actual letter that he was penning as he writes it. He believes that God was going to use this as a means of correcting the Galatians' error. Like I said, he knew what he saw. He knew what he witnessed when God made, God made him a partaker of that event when the Holy Spirit came in power upon these Galatian people. He witnessed the Holy Spirit's power. And so he was trusting in Christ's faithfulness to fix all this mess. He was firmly persuaded that a sovereign, the sovereign God of the universe was a God of means. He is. God is a God of means. A God who uses instrumental means. Yes, even weak, broken, unpolished instruments like Paul. Like you, Christian. Do do you believe that about yourself? Do you believe that you're an instrument in the hand of the living God? As weak and broken and unpolished as you are, You see, what's required in in, in usefulness to God is not you becoming great. It's not your ability, your skill set, your strength. We've heard this in the first hour, did we not? I mean, if you're waiting for God to make you great in order to be used in some fashion, you're placing far, far, far too much confidence in you and not in the Lord whom all your confidence should be in. All in the One who is, whose power is made perfect in weakness, as we just heard moments ago. Most of our reliance, I think if we're honest, most of our reliance is far too much on our own ability and not on God. Paul knew. Paul knew he was weak. He knew what he was made of. I mean, he boasted, did he not? He boasted of his weakness so that the power of Christ would would rest upon him. That's why why his confidence wasn't in himself. And his confidence wasn't in the Galatians, that's for sure. It was in the one who, if we go back to chapter 1, who set him apart before he was born and called him by his grace. It was he who was pleased to take Paul, to take to tear out of Paul that Pharisaical leaven that was in his breast and give him a new heart, give him a new life, and reveal his son to him. You see, we put way too much stock in instruments today. We do. Big name preachers, big name ministries. I mean, if they say it, it's pretty much gospel. And we've developed all kinds of man-made constructs and how-to programs in our day, but they're void of the power of God. Why? Why? Too much leaning and trusting in man. It reminds me of Paris Reedhead when he was talking about the Chinese Christian who visited America and spent some time in American churches. He goes back to China and and was asked, what impressed you most about America? He said, the great things Americans can do without God. Sad testimony. Yes, God does use human instruments. But left to themselves without Holy Spirit power, they're worthless and completely ineffective. Like John said, read, the battle's not yours, it's the Lord's, right? We've got this um, baby grand piano in our living room, if you've ever been to our house. It's just a wonderful instrument, right? Produces all kinds of wonderful sounds. You can 
and nearly be raptured up into the heavens with it. And you know, it can enhance your worship, enhance meditation. I like to hear it when I'm preparing for messages, and it doesn't happen as much anymore. But, but uh, I mean, it can create joyful melodies. No one would question that. It can be a balm for weary, downcast souls. But you know what? If unless Hannah plays it, it's just going to collect dust. That's all it's going to do. It's just a dust collector. Now, yes, her students will come and they'll pluck away at it, plunk away at it, and it's it's encouraging. You know, I'm up in my study. I, I can hear them and yeah, I can hear some improvements in, in her students. But but that piano, as glorious of an instrument as it is, it's completely powerless to produce any music on its own. It needs the hand of a skillful musician. Likewise, the instruments of God. They need the all-powerful hand of the Mighty One in order to produce anything good. Anything good. That was Paul's confidence here in correcting the Galatians. This is God's work. I'm His servant, but this is all on Him. It's His power. It's His work. He started this and He says He's going to complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. He will see this thing through. That's why Paul had the confidence he did. And Paul continues here pronouncing judgment. I have confidence in the Lord. He will take no other view than mine. And the one who's troubling you will bear the penalty. Whoever he is. Now up to this point, Paul's reference to the Judaizers was in the plural. Here, here, here it shifts into singular. The one who's troubling you. This is where Paul places the ultimate guilt for the Galatian heresy. The, the troubler. This troubler, whoever he is, perhaps he's a ringleader, we don't know. We really don't. We don't even know if Paul knows. But we do, what we do know is Paul speaks of certainty of judgment here. He will bear the penalty. Whoever he is. Paul speaks this way to the, to the Corinthians when speaking of Satan's counterfeit apostles being disguised as angels of light in 2 Corinthians 11.15. He says, It is no surprise if his servants, that is Satan's servants, disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Paul clearly referring to divine retribution that all the troublers of God's people will face. Jude calls such folks fruitless trees in late autumn. Twice dead, uprooted. Wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame. Wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. It's a serious matter, false teaching. Verse 11. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. Now, I did address this verse when we looked at chapter 1, verse 10. That, that despite not having all the, the details we would like to, we'd like to have here, it's very apparent that Paul was being accused of preaching circumcision. And as such was being slanderously accused by as being slanderously accused of hypocrisy by these Judaizers, which directly calls his apostleship into question, right? That's what they were aiming at. That's what they were doing. That's how they were slandering Paul. They would have been claiming this guy's a massive hypocrite. Are you kidding me? And it's interesting how the finger the finger pointing claim of those who call out hypocrites are actually most more times than not the hypocrite themselves. But these Judaizers would have been claiming that, you know, Paul Paul had Timothy circumcised, and he's here telling you you ought not be circumcising. I mean he 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 circumcises Timothy, and here he's vehemently rejecting circumcision as a corruption of the gospel. Paul's inconsistent. What gives? Well, Paul knows. Paul understands. 
And Paul made himself a living sacrifice for the gospel. The Judaizers were religiously ignorant of the gospel. Paul became all things to all people that by all means he might save some. The gospel and its glory and its advancement controlled every aspect of Paul's decision making. That even included Paul's use of the law when it was advantageous for him to utilize it for gospel good. That's precisely what led to Timothy getting circumcised. We learn there in Acts 16 that Paul wanted Timothy Timothy to accompany him and that he took him and, and had him circumcised because of the Jews. Because they knew, there was Jews in that area, and they knew that Timothy's father was a Greek. Meanwhile, Paul's carrying with him this Jerusalem council decision that says the Gentiles don't need to be circumcised. So, so why did Paul do it? Why did Paul have Timothy circumcised? Because Paul didn't want Timothy's uncircumcised state to be any kind of hindrance to evangelizing the Jews. It's one thing when you're evangelizing lost Jews, and it's another thing when you're teaching saved Christians what's essential to Christian living. That's how Paul treated non-essential matters, like that of circumcision. For the sake of the Gospel, for the Gospel's sake, to the Jew I became as a Jew, Paul said. Why? That I might win the Jew. Knowing Timothy was a son of a Greek man and therefore not circumcised, that would have closed the door for him to gain the ear of a Jew when he went to the synagogues in in Philippi. So Paul encourages Timothy to get circumcised. Whereas in other situations, he he does the exact opposite. Like that of Titus that we we saw in chapter 2. Titus was a Greek, but he was coming to visit Jewish Christians. And Paul says, no. You're not getting circumcised. i got a point to prove here. That's not necessary. The Judaizers' response? You're a hypocrite, Paul. That's what you are. You're just a people pleaser. You're just out to get a following for yourself. You just, want to, you just want to do and say whatever satisfies those around you. You behave like a Jew when you're among the Jews, and yet you get out there amongst the Gentiles like Titus, and you just tell them, you tell them they, 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 they have to keep the law and get circumcised or they don't have to. It's proof positive, Paul. You're just a wannabe apostle. Just seeking human approval. That's the kind of thing Paul was hearing. That's the kind of accusations that were getting thrown around and charges laid at him. And so Paul makes, wants to make very clear in this letter his real thoughts and understanding of circumcision under the new covenant. He says it counts for nothing. We read that. And that statement's being made against folks who are attributing their circumcision and to being truly identified as the children of Abraham. You see the difference in, in Paul's treatment see circumcision as a, as a matter of indifference until or unless folks make it otherwise. He sees it as an instrument of good in some circumstances and a stumbling block of evil for others. What's the determining factor? The Gospel. Always the Gospel. When used to gain and provide a hearing for the Gospel among the Jews, Paul finds it very beneficial. When, when looked to it in any kind of way as having salvific value, as essential to one's salvation, he utterly rejects it as another gospel. From the perspective of a Christian, this appears to be genius. It's indeed, it's, be, it's becoming all things to all people that by all means we might save some. From the perspective of lost religious people, who place their confidence in circumcision, their identity in circumcision, and in, in do religion, it appears to be nothing but inconsistent, people-pleasing, hypocrisy. It just confounds the minds of those who are legalistic. And brother, this highlights for us the need to live out our lives with an eye toward and a clear conscience before God. We can't live our lives fearing men and what they say or what they think. We need to live them in the fear of the Lord and for the sake of the Gospel. And when you do that, you can count on being called all kinds of things. 
You, you just be dedicated to living for the sake of the Gospel and you'll be called all manner of things from all sides and all sources. It'll happen. You can count on actually being treated just like Jesus was, right? If they call the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they call his servants, right? Those of his household. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, Jesus says. Because so did their father speak to the false prophets. But he continues on here. In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. At the end there, at the end there verse 11. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, how, how does the cross offend? Besides the fact a man hanging on a cross is a mark of cursedness before God. And because of that, it's a stumbling block for the Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. It also offends by stripping a man of any merit whatsoever before God. So as soon as you proclaim circumcision as a means of getting some kind of merit before God, you strip the cross of its power and its glory. The cross is a declaration of our depravity and our only hope. That's what it is. It condemns man and saves man all in one. <laughs> you see, proud people, they don't want to admit that they need a crucified man in order to be reconciled to God. Utterly reject that. Verse 12, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Now, <laughs> Paul's going all out savage mode here. I mean, there's just no getting around this. This is very vulgar and gross. And frankly, there are some places in Scripture that don't speak all that kind of words. It's just a fact. I know our tendency is to come along and try to soften the blow of Scripture. And, you know, tone it down a little nicer, make it a little more Christian. And I mean, like I said, when I first started the series, I was like, how in the world am I going to preach this verse without blushing? What exactly am I going to say? I mean, this is some pretty graphic stuff here. And I'm still asking that question. I mean, this is... This is colorful language by Paul. I mean, just coming off his thoughts on false accusations made against him, he has a little moment here, shall we say, of sanctified sarcasm. In case you don't know what the word emasculate means, it means to cut off. And of course, contextually, we're talking about the subject of circumcision. likely to make some very interesting lunchtime discussions this, this afternoon. <laughs> hey, blame, blame Paul, not me. Rather than going for the jugular, Paul goes elsewhere. Paul's so upset with how these folks have upset the faith of these precious converts of his, he just goes off here. And you apostates are so fixated using that knife, cutting into my converts, hindering them from the finish line. Why don't you just go ahead and take that knife and go all the way on yourselves? All the way. Cut it off. Castrate yourselves. And Paul may even have in mind here Deuteronomy 23.1 which forbids emasculated individuals from entering the assembly of God. Mrs. Paul, rolling up his sleeves as it were, take your knives and get out of Dodge or take them to yourself. And we have to keep in mind the serious nature. I mean, the Gospel is on the line here. I know we're so far removed from that, but... And that's why Paul uses such strong language here and throughout this letter. Had the Judaizers prevailed in Galatia, brethren? Had they prevailed? Humanly speaking, 
it's very likely we, none of us here would have ever heard the gospel. It's how important this was. Well, in closing, let's just briefly consider again Paul's opening statement of verse 7. You were running well. Let me just ask you, Christian, are you running well? I mean well. Is your Christianity present tense or is it primarily past tense? There was a time you were running well, but that's no longer the case. And that's a serious question to contemplate and consider. Consider the why. I mean, perhaps you started out in this thing on fire and you came out of the gates in blazing glory, blowing everyone by, and you, now you've been, somehow you've been reduced to this walking pace. I mean, what's, what's the cause? For these Galatians, amazingly, it was bad doctrine. I mean, these... These, these are Apostle Paul converts. You couldn't get a better source for accurate doctrine. But, but they, you see, they bought in over time. They bought into the falsehood of, of the Judaizer.com website, if you will. I mean, they heard the, they got the Jerusalem credentials. I mean, handful of verses from the Old Testament. I mean, doesn't that make them legit? You see, false teaching to this day, even though the gospel has arrived here, is still a very dangerous tool of the devil. I see this pastorally. People getting ensnared by some wise article online which lines up with their own reason and desire of carnal flesh. And Brethren, don't get bewitched by falsehood. Stay grounded in Scripture. Maybe, maybe you're here today and you're cramping up. You know, you're in this race. You're cramping up. You're feeling tempted just to, to quit, to throw in the towel. I think we all have days like that. We all have moments. We all have seasons like that. You know, too many trials. You feel, you know, just this running's too difficult. There's, there's too many obstacles. There's too many dangers, toils, and snares, and you just feel tired and faint and parched and. Brethren, this is a call for holy hydration. A call to drink from the fountain of living waters again. A call not to give place to your flesh in the allurements of this world. A call to rid yourself of any weights that may be slowing you down in this race and slowly turning you into a were running well. Oh, brethren, let it be I am running well. We need to, as Christians, always be moving forward and upward in this Christian race, moving toward the goal, the prize, that finish line. Paul said it. Brethren, I hope everyone in this room is able to say it on their deathbed or wherever that death takes place. I have finished the race. That's, those are the ultimate words before death, aren't they? I've finished. I've made it to the end. There's a race that we must finish, Christian. It ain't over yet. A race that requires us staying in the faith. A race that requires us to run it so as to win it. A race that possesses many threats of keeping us from finishing it. I mean, there are things, there are people, there are weights that will seek to slow you down and take you out. I trust most of you know the the story of Eric Little, um, the Olympic star there in the, in the 1920s who had a movie made after him, The Chariots of Fire. He loved to run. I can't relate to that, but he, he loved to run. And you know what fueled his running? I do, I love this. The pleasure of God. He actually said, when I run, I feel His pleasure. Now, if that were the case, I'd be bolting out that door and just keep going, right? 
But I don't feel nothing but my knees and out of breath and the side ache and... <laughs> oh, what an, what an incredible gift to run and feel the pleasure of God. I mean, and I thought, what a, what a great spiritual parallel for us. God's pleasure kept him in the race. And you got this guy he's next to you. You know, this guy, you're, you're, you're neck and neck. His goal is some wreath that's just going to wither up in the, in, the, in the sun. He's running next to some guy. God Almighty. He's just feeling the pleasure of God. I mean, he's got the fuel to make it to the finish. No wonder he won. He did. He's an incredible, he's an incredible runner. God's pleasure keeping him in the race. It fueled his pace. It brought him to the finish line. What's bringing you to the finish line? Brethren, it's got to be God's Word. It's got to be His promises. It's got to be clinging to Christ. And there are a thousand distractions out there that will keep you from that. Keep that finish line in view, in sight. Don't take your eyes off it. Find the pleasure of God. Because brethren, that really is the answer of getting us to the end. The pleasure and joy of pleasing and knowing Christ. Father, I pray that would, You would so help us. Oh Lord, all the, all the distractions, all the potential being knocked out of this race. Lord, we don't want to, be, we don't want to possess a past tense religion a past tense Christianity. We want to be in the active verb of running and running well by Your grace and being able to boast in that grace. So Lord, help us to do so. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.